This is Rob Peary with the Coffee Runs Deep podcast, where we interview coffee farmers, coffee roasters, and we share their stories. Truly hope you enjoy the experience. Welcome, everyone. Hope you enjoy the episode today. We dive into a few cool topics, such as starting a coffee trailer, roasting on the Alia Bullet, and the ups and downs of the coffee business journey. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Coffee Runs Deep podcast. I'm your host, Rob Peary, and I have an exciting guest on today from Colorado, Mr. Tyler Ellison with Storyline Coffee Roasters, who's based in Buena Vista, Colorado. Uh, Tyler, let's start out introducing yourself and telling me kind of where Storyline Roasters came about. Yeah, man. Thanks so much, first of all, for having me on. It's an honor. Uh, I've been listening to your podcast kind of since it started, and it's been a, it's been cool just to see it grow and what it's turned into. So I'm, I'm super excited to be on. And kind of how we started out um, kind of goes back before Storyline, and we'll, we'll cross that bridge eventually. But um, it really started with a buddy in mind. We were just really passionate about uh, coffee. We loved um kind of Colorado is pretty fortunate. Like I think Colorado and California was kind of the front runners of craft coffee, um, California and like the West coast, I think a little before Colorado, but they were pretty quickly behind. And so we started kind of getting into like floral and fruity coffees and like, man, this stuff's really great. And so, uh, we were always pretty entrepreneurial and wanted to kind of start our own deal. And so we started roasting actually on a barbecue grill in our backyard. Um, super ghetto setup with like a, a drill that was attached to this like extender bit and then it had a drum inside of it and uh, we had like hair ties that would like hold the trigger so it'd keep rotating you didn't have to do it the whole time um, but it was it was a cool start in the sense of like it was a drum roaster and it had a like temperature gauge so you could actually get like decent data from it in the sense of like we every 30 seconds would write down like where the temperature was at and what it was doing and how long. And so uh, we actually got some like decent coffee out of it, surprisingly. Um, And that kind of started us into the coffee business. At the time we were called Sip Coffee. So um, we, over a couple of beers one night, just uh, went on Colorado, like state gov and, you know, looked up, did our due diligence, got a name, and uh, went for it. We're like, all right, like, let's do this thing. So we started just giving it to friends and family. And then there was a connection we had that was actually a private Christian school. And they had a tabletop roaster there. Uh, it was a Diedrich, like just their little tabletop version. It would do, it was a three kilo. So I think it'd do like five pounds at a time. And they're like, hey, this thing sits in here dormant, like doesn't get used at all. So if you guys want to come in here and use it, like it's all yours. So uh, what was it we quickly... Say that again. What was it again? It's a Diedrich. Diedrich. Uh, so it was their tabletop version. And uh, I think it was a three kilo. It would do about five pounds. And it was it was a perfect little setup. And uh, we could use it whenever we wanted to and go in there and roast. And so that kind of opened up the doors of like, hey, we can actually like, you know, get some wholesale accounts and crank up some uh, volume. And so got our first wholesale account and uh started like growing from there we realized like okay there's actually like some validity to what we're doing um at the time i was actually working for a guy with the plans to eventually do coffee like open a coffee shop with him um and that fell through it was a horrible like business partnership in some senses and that's okay uh so all of a sudden like i was without a job and uh newly married and my wife and I were like, hey, if we're going to do this coffee thing, like it's now or never, we'd always had a dream of doing it. And so we then jumped in full, full steam ahead. We got like a $25,000 loan uh, to get the coffee trailer and uh, was still roasting and still like we're selling coffee uh, to people and stuff. But then like, all right, like, let's do this thing. So when that happened, um, it was just like a crazy learning curve. So prior to this, I had experience in coffee in the sense of roasting and knew a lot of the like scientific technical back inside of things on that end, but never worked a day as a barista, never pulled a shot of espresso, like never steamed milk before. And I was like, all right, like I can, I can learn anything, right? If someone's willing to teach me. So we, uh, we jumped in and luckily the coffee culture in Denver was incredible. Um, 
And since we moved up to the mountains in Buena Vista, like I miss that culture and vibe um, because man, like the people and shop owners were like just so welcoming and so open to like, hey, like we'll show you like how to pull espresso and how to steam milk. And like, here's what we're doing roasting. Like, tell us what you're doing. Like, we'll help you get better. Let's do cuppings together. And so um, the culture down in Denver was super inclusive and just like, it wasn't this idea of like, hey, you're my competition, like you're going to be still my customers. It was more so just like, hey, how can we all get better as a coffee industry together? Um, like, let's cup together. Let's share like roasting quote unquote secrets, which doesn't exist, you know, um, and just like, let's let's make the coffee scene in Denver really great. So um, it was a cool kind of launching point for us because we had some people come along and be like, hey, you know, 18, 20 grams in, 40 grams out, 30 seconds. Here's how to steam milk um you know just practice at home so back in the corner over there is like our espresso machine we started with we still have it um it's a la speciale the ball day uh, single group head it's a workhorse um and it was we literally set it up with like a five gallon uh pump underneath and had it on our kitchen top as we were going and uh just practiced a bunch and um and so we had pulled out the $25,000 loan with the idea of doing a food truck at the time. Food trucks were kind of like up and coming and there was a lot of them starting to pop up around the area. And we're like, man, we could do this exactly like year was. Yeah. So this was back in 2016 was when we okay. went full into it. Um, I started roasting, gosh, uh, back in 2011. So we roasted for a long time and just like, you know, through college. And so at times it was a bigger deal for me. And at times it was just kind of like a hobby and it kind of fizzled out. But um, yeah, I've almost been roasting for, I guess not 2011. That's a lie. I've only been roasting seven years. So whatever that math is, um, 2015, 14, around that time. Uh, I don't know where I got 2011 from. Anyways, I've been roasting for like seven years. And then we jumped in around 2016 to like get the loan um, and then start the coffee truck, which was, um, super intimidating. Cause all of a sudden it was like, in the meantime, I was bartending to just try to like keep some money coming in, but that was like consuming, like all of my time of like getting a business plan figuring out numbers and, you know, like trying to see like, okay, how can we make this work? What amount of wholesale accounts do we need to have to sustain us? And so my viewpoint was always like, hey, if I can get enough wholesale accounts to just cover our nut, like, hey, we've got to pay this much on our loan. We uh, were about to rent a space and like, um, there was a big roaster. So that was when we moved to uh, Diedrich IR7, which was like a 30, was it a 30 kilo or 15? I think it was a 15 kilo. It would do 30 pounds. So yeah, 15 kilo roaster. Um, and we were sharing a space with another roaster in Castle Rock, which is where we were at at the time. And uh, I was like, all right, how, how can I make sure that my wholesale accounts cover that? And then anything we do in the trailer is like extra and that'll then generate more revenue and stuff like that. So tried to figure out like what amount of money I would need to make just with our wholesale. And so that way I knew like, hey, if this coffee trailer thing I think is going to go well, doesn't like at least we'll still be able to pay off our loan and like figure something out. So that was kind of how we approached it. I think as a roaster, it's a good way to just like give you some breathing room. So you're not all in on, um, you know, either having to hustle cups. Cause personally, I think there's two real ways to make money in coffee. Uh, kind of how I delineated in my head is either volume, which is like hustling out cups, right? So as many people that we can turn over in our shop is how we can generate money and uh you gotta have a lot of that when it's you know three five seven dollar orders coming in the door and so that's one way to do it and the other way is just by like massive volume and wholesale so what i realized pretty quickly with doing it was the amount of time and effort it took to do like a 40 pound wholesale order was pretty minimal especially on like a big roaster i could crank that out in like an hour sealing if they wanted it ground or whatever and just like get it to the people and it would take me like an hour hour and a half of work total and i was like man i just generated me like a couple hundred dollars which in a shop and on the storefront side like 
takes me a lot of time and hustle and I then have to like pay people and you know keep the lights running and all that kind of stuff so to me it was just kind of this realization of okay there's two ways really to make money in coffee if I can have all my bases covered on the wholesale side then you know the cart and all that kind of stuff can generate other things so kind of going back to the starting of it we uh, had our friends and over to our apartment complex and just like said hey like we're going to act, you're going to order from this menu and we're going to like time each, how long it takes to, you know, from the time you order to the time you have your drink total to get through how many people. So we have like all these timers running and just had people like go through and place orders. And so oh, that's cool. we'd actually like, yeah. And it was a really great way to practice. Uh, and one, I like our friends loved it because they were like a part of us launching and starting. And um, it was just a fun way to kind of include them and be like, Hey, like, come be a part of like our pre-launch party, get some free coffee out of it. And then it gave us really good metrics to know like, hey, if we're at like a 20,000 person event, that's awesome. But if we're taking like three or four minutes on that like craft coffee side to get through people, that may take a while. And so trying to figure out how long it would take us. Um, my wife and I had it down to a pretty good art of like, she would take the orders. I usually ran the espresso machine we could crank through them pretty quick once we kind of got the system down and stuff, but it was a really like fail proof way of trying to learn how to like work out all the kinks of like, Oh, our internet went down. Like, can we still do this thing? Cause now all of a sudden, like I can't take people's credit cards. And so uh, we use square for our POS system. And, uh, it worked out good. You know, if your internet goes down, you can still do it for like 24 hours and stuff. So um, we did that and, uh, had a menu kind of created we had created up some like specialty drinks and stuff like that and, uh, when we first went into it we wanted to really stay craft and be doing chemexes and pour overs and all that kind of stuff um, and we did when we first started um, our first event was on July 4th and I think there was close to 10,000 people there and it was insanely busy um, it was super cool uh, but we had the coffee trailer all built out and ready to go. We pulled it up there. And like, you think you've crossed every T and dotted every I, like I did so much research and like felt really prepared and like ready to go. We had, you know, run our generator and made sure everything was good and good to go and all that stuff. I was like, all right, like we're good. And the first thing we do is like take it off the truck. Right. And the ground is soft, which like, you can't prepare for it, right? Like you don't know that the ground's gonna be soft there. And the jack like sinks into the ground. And so I'm like, what are we, you know, like you can't be like serving coffee, like leaning out the window, you know? So we like had to find a bunch of like two by fours to put on the ground, try to keep it level and stuff. And just like, uh, we had a, I think it was a 20 gallon tank of water on the outside, which I thought was gonna be plenty. And we cranked through 20 gallons in like no time. And so, uh, Luckily, we had tons of friends and family there. My dad like ran to a neighbor and was like, hey, can I like borrow some water? <laughs> and so like refilled up the tank and stuff. But just those like things that you think you've you've prepared for and just you never know until you do it. Um, but we like we crushed it. I think we did over I think we did eleven or twelve hundred dollars in revenue that first day um, at that event. So it was really encouraging. So I was like, man, like, OK, we can do this. Like that was insane. Uh, doing that amount of Chemexes for coffee was miserable. And so, uh, you know, but we quickly learned like, hey, this is viable, like we can make this happen. And so the plan with the coffee truck when we built it out was to go to office spaces uh, throughout the week. And so this is pre-COVID before everyone was uh, working at home and all that stuff. And like office spaces and buildings were pretty packed out, especially in like the Denver Tech Center, which is where a lot of those spaces were. And like, hey, if we have a route, like can hit a couple different office spaces, like one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and just like continually be there, there's, you know, a couple thousand people in those office spaces. If we can get reoccurring customers there and then do events on the weekend, like I think we can make this happen. So um, the office spaces were incredible in the sense that like we had really great support from those people. Um, which is really what we loved about coffee. Um, I'm a coffee nerd. I love the like science and like geeking out on that side of things. But what it did for us was like allowed us to kind of connect with people on a deeper level of like, 
hey, like, how's your kid's soccer game? And, you know, just like get to know people more personally than the sense of just like, hey, here's your cup of coffee, like, we'll see you tomorrow. So I think that's one of the things that people overlook when they start to sometimes is the importance of really good customer service. Uh, I really believe like you can have the best product in the world, but like if you're not connecting with people on some sort of level, they're not going to keep coming back to you. So um, my wife and I are super personal with people and just like want to get to know people on a deeper level. And so I think people support us, whether it was for our coffee or whether it was just for like they liked us, uh, they kept coming back. And so uh, the office buildings was interesting, though. We thought it would be really great. Um, and there were some days we would do like a couple hundred dollars and there's other days we'd do like 20 or 50 bucks. And so it was really hard of like, you're sitting out there and if people aren't coming, like you're just kind of like stuck there, you know? So um, we realized that like events was like a really big money generator for us. Um, and so we started pushing pretty hard into events. Uh, we partnered with, uh, CenturyLink and so they would set up and kind of like be an internet provider for an apartment complex and they give out free coffee and so we were their coffee provider and then like they get a free cup of coffee go talk with the CenturyLink guy that was cool. um, yeah and so that was like a cool connection opportunity we got involved with some wedding venues um, actually where my wife and I got married we ended up uh, doing coffee there and so we quickly realized like, man, this truck is awesome. And it was a sweet build out and worked really great, had everything that we needed, but uh, there was also people that like wanted us to come inside. And so uh, I'm, a, I'm a yes man, probably to a fault. And sometimes like, you know, and so we, we tried to make this stuff happen. And so we're like, yeah, like we can come inside and, and do the setup. And so we're like hauling all of our stuff off of the trailer into like their bar setup and and doing it and so we could be like hey like what if we did a cart and um i know one of the questions of like what would you have done differently i think if i would have gone back and done it i would have started with a cart um because it was so much easier to transport it was so much more mobile you could take it indoors or outdoors as long as you had electrical which like with the area we were in it was a lot of like city stuff and if not you can have a generator go in and pull it far enough back that like it's not loud or anything um and that's like just super easy we had two carts set up side by side we could angle them or do just different setups and so we kind of fit in any space and uh it was way less i mean we got like sam's club carts and like built out wood on the front of them made them look sweet uh but like cost wise it was pretty pretty efficient compared to like a trailer and a truck and all that kind of stuff that we needed generator you know, hand washing sink, you had to go through like Tri County Health and make sure that like, you know, the water temps worked and you had certain lights and screens and all kinds of stuff that you just never think like you need uh, when you're running a food truck or something like that. So like, I'm just serving coffee, but um, so the cart was really, was really a huge win for us in the sense of like, hey, we can go indoors, outdoors, um, and it was more mobile and easy to get. Um, and so we started doing events with the cart. Um, and so we served at the wedding venue we were at. Uh, we did like Taste of Colorado art shows. We did just all kinds of stuff, really like wherever a food truck was, we would try to go and get. And that generated a lot of other business for us. Um, we got wholesale accounts from that. Uh, we would get other events and parties booked because someone would come see us and be like, oh, you're you know, coffee truck looks amazing. Like, can you guys do this, you know, office party that we've got coming up? And so just getting out there and getting our name visible to a lot of people, whether the event did good for us revenue wise or not was, was huge just to kind of keep more business coming to us. Yeah. I think that's one of those key things in life too, is just putting yourself out there. hundred percent. Yeah, Cause that's, that's like, me and my wife have been talking about that a lot lately. Just like, you know, just continue to put out videos, continue to do podcasts, continue to shoot weddings or whatever. You just continue to show up, you know, yeah. like different opportunities kind of come and present themselves like that. So was that y'all's full-time job through this whole thing basically, or, or did somebody have a part-time job or was y'all just solely focused hundred percent on the coffee? Yeah. Yeah. So we were 
my wife had like a small part-time gig, but for a probably 75% of when we had the coffee truck and trailer um, and carts was like, that was all we were doing. Uh, and I'll say this, like, uh, I think coffee is like glamorized and it seems really awesome and amazing. We were working our butts off doing this thing. Like, so we roasted, we did our own chai, we did our own syrups, we did our own cold brew. We had wholesale accounts like we did everything and so uh which was awesome and it was it was really cool to be able to say like oh this lavender syrup's really great and like tell them like yeah we actually get the lavender buds and we do cane sugar for our like simple syrups and that's how we make it and like bring them into kind of that process and why we care about it um and why you know it's better than just like the pouring like sugary artificial flavored yeah. syrups and so <clears throat> we but like man, there were so many mornings you'd get up at like 4 a.m., make syrups, get like the truck ready. You'd be out, like we live in Colorado, so it's three degrees outside and you're like trying to pour water into a hole the size of like a quarter. So now you're wet, it's freezing. You've got to like put a heater on the truck to make sure that your pipes don't freeze. And so there's a lot of work that like we never really saw coming. And so, um, and good news, bad news. Good news is like we grew, uh, but we grew so quickly that like we couldn't really keep up. And so again, being a yes man, like I wanted to say yes to like taking events and doing all this stuff. Um, but I think at the time being honest, like I was just immature in the sense of like, I didn't know how to own and run a business and have people work for me as opposed to like, man, this is my baby. This is my passion. Like, how can I give this to someone else and expect them to do all this work? Like, you know, how are they going to parallel park this trailer in downtown Denver? <laughs> you know, which to me was terrifying in and of itself. Like, how do I like hire someone? Be like, all right, like, here you go. Good luck. Um, and so we, I don't think we could grow well because I just didn't have the maturity and like business knowledge that I have now to know like, hey, we should hire staff. Let's train them. That way we can like step off and focus on the things that we need to be focused on and then grow well. Instead, we just were like getting stretched thinner and thinner and thinner. And um, eventually we were just like, you know, when you work in like a six foot five, four foot box with your wife uh, <laughs> in like cold or really hot spaces, you know, you start like tempers start flaring. And, uh, we had a lot of like really hard times um, kind of going back to one of the first things we talked about was we started out as sip coffee. Um, and all of a sudden I got an email from this lady that said like, Hey, I see that you're sip coffee. I'm also sip coffee. Uh, I just wanted to know like what's going on because she was getting phone calls like for us, but to her. And so rewind back to the couple of beers when my buddy had, when we were starting this business. We looked up and did our due diligence. And, like no one had the name sip coffee. We saw that like five years ago, someone had started a business called sip but they were inactive. They closed the business and it had been like two or three years. Well, she started her business back up. And so we didn't know this at the time, but she owned the naming rights because she had once had a business prior with that same name. So it didn't matter that she like, when we started was inactive, she had the name first, it was hers. And oh, wow. so, yeah, again, just like one of those big things of what, like, what do you do? So we like, had to get a lawyer involved because she we like tried to work it out civilly with her and like she was a nice lady like there's nothing against against her or what she did obviously it sucked because like what do you mean like we have all this branding we have cups we have sleeves we have like this truck with like sip on the side of it we have hats shirts like all this stuff it's like man that's a lot of money that we're gonna have to just like get rid of and so lawyers got involved she was in the right we were in the wrong in some senses and so we had until, so we've been doing this for, I think like nine or 10 months. And we had like two months to completely change a name, get rid of all inventory and take down all marketing materials of our old name. And Dang. so it was like, yeah, uh, New Year's Eve was literally spent with like me and my, me and my wife and like our two best friends. And we were all four of us logged into our social medias trying to delete stuff like before midnight. <laughs> 
because we just like all of a sudden realized like oh my gosh like there's stuff from like four years ago on Facebook when like you were roasting on our barbecue grill that's like still up there with Sip's name on and like all that had to come down so um that kind of sucks because you know like from a social media standpoint like we have this really cool like big long story of like how we started and came about and really all you see is like hey there's this one picture of this coffee truck and then like storyline uh because we had to take all that stuff down so that was a huge thing that just like again you can plan and prepare as much as you possibly want and just like stuff happens so yeah um, wow dude i couldn't imagine yeah. that like magic one taking <laughs> all my videos down like all the podcasts mm-hmm. down like that's a lot of time and work right Jeez, please yeah and and then it was like okay what like we can get rid of all that stuff and like start, you know, slowly transitioning, but like now we got to find a new name. Now we got to like get new branding and stuff. And so luckily uh, we had a friend, Jen Wagner, and she, she designed up like storyline logo we have now. Um, and it was actually a cool moment for us because we could really kind of like look back and make, okay, what are we about? And for us, it was, we felt like every person has a story and we wanted to connect with that story. Um, and so in the same sense, like coffee has a really cool story and the, like processing and picking and the, you know, where the origin comes from and like all that stuff that goes into it, all the hands that touch it and the producers and farmers and millers and all that stuff that, like people don't really know about. And then it comes overseas and we roast it and then we ship it to the end customer. So like it has this long story that impacts taste and the cupping notes that you get, um, and so we wanted to kind of connect that story with people's story because that was something that we really loved of just like getting to know people and connecting with them and like sharing our hearts with them. And so yeah. it's kind of where the name storyline came about. And, uh, Did you secure the name now? Yeah. So okay. uh, we like trademarked it. We went, <laughs> we went all out. Uh, Dude, actually, I mean, I'm, I'm actually going to write that down. I'm kind of worried about that. Like, I know I have a weird company name, but still, like, yeah. I don't want anybody ever to... Yeah, and so a trademark, like, really. I think it's like 200 and, I mean, it's all relative, right? But I think it's like 250 bucks to trademark your name. Um, and it, like, it does go a long ways in the sense of, like, the only thing you have to do is actively be protecting your name. And so if you see someone come up, uh, which we've had to do, of like, there's a storyline that came up in, like, China, and we had to, like, try to reach out to them. And it doesn't matter that they, like, change your name or get rid of it but it's just the fact that you can show like hey i've i've attempted to protect my business name and uh then you're good you can keep it active and so i would say like if when you get to the point of like actually starting a roasting facility and media company like it may be worth the 250 bucks just like hey trademark it uh they make it seem like really intimidating on their website like you need a lawyer and like if you do it without a lawyer you have to like I did it just by myself. I was like, I have to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And it, it went fine. Like it got approved. Uh, I looked at other people's, like I looked at Black Rifles and some other people's coffee companies and just like copied what they did essentially of like, hey, number 26 is coffee roasting and beans. Number 34, because there's like weird numbers associated with oh, it. So you so. can look them up and see like what Black Rifle Coffee did or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. It's oh, so, like cool. you could look up like Storyline Coffee and like see how we did it. You can see Black Rifle, like Sweet Bloom, other companies that are trademarked. And so you can kind of just like mirror theirs with your own name and stuff, obviously. But uh, that was super helpful just to know, yeah. like, you know. Dude, I'm actually, I'm actually going to do that. Because I ain't going to lie, if I had to go and delete all my videos and stuff, I would yeah. I'd probably cry. I haven't cried in years, but I would literally probably break down and cry. Yeah. So much, it's so many hours of work. Oh, dude, it was a rough, it was a rough New Year's. I mean, like, <laughs> it was just one of the most, like, chaotic times, because, like, you're trying to, like, go out with your friends and have a good time, and, like, we had Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, like, everyone was logged in on their mm-hmm. phones, which is like, okay, I got this off, like, Facebook, and we'd, like, be saying the dates out, and people probably thought we were, like, some psychos, like, freaking out about social media before the New Year came or something, but um, we got it all done. And uh, changed our name, went transferred over. And um, at that time, like the business had grown to such like a crazy extent. And like, we just didn't know how to 
like let it go in certain senses of like hiring people and bringing people on. And so it kind of came to this point where for my wife and I was like, Hey, look, like we're either going to be married forever or we're going to have this business and probably be divorced. Uh, Cause it just like things had gotten so heated and it was super stressful. Um, like trying to run a business and do marketing and keep up with wholesales and like do all this stuff that was just like, there's a lot of stresses that we didn't, we didn't see coming. And I think if I, if I did it today, I think we could do it in such a better way in knowing what you know, but hindsight's always 2020, right? Like we jumped in headfirst into the coffee truck and trailer deal. And uh, I don't regret like a day of it. We had some of the best times uh, ever. Our one claim to fame is that we, uh, we served Snoop Dogg a cup of coffee. So really, uh, yeah, he was at a, he was at a wedding we did. Y'all have anything special in it or was it just coffee? No, what ironically, I mean, uh, you are in Colorado, so I guess exactly, it's, you know, it's funny you say that, which is what the whole reason Snoop Dogg was there is the people that were getting married uh, owned a bunch of dispensaries. And so they had like a weed bar at the wedding. There was a coffee bar because they were big in the coffee. There was like an alcohol bar. And so it was like the craziest wedding uh, we ever did. But it was actually super cool. Uh, there was like a VIP booth and they were like, hey, these members uh, want these drinks and like we'll deliver them to you. So like I didn't personally serve him, but it was for Snoop Dogg. And like, so that's like our one little claim to fame. It was that's fun. Cool. Yeah. So, so do, y'all, do y'all still have the trailer then? No. So we actually, um, going back to kind of like that New Year's time frame, we got to the point where you're like, all right, like, what do we do? My wife's way more important than any business ever will be. Um, and so I was like, all right, like, I'm going to be married forever. I can always start another business or do something else. And so we ended up selling the coffee trailer. Uh, we sold some of our wholesale accounts. Uh, we kept some of this stuff. So like we kept our espresso machine, our grinder, um, trying to think what else we kept. Wait, what do you mean sold like a wholesale account? You just like, so you sold the like wholesale account to some other business? Exactly. Yeah. I didn't realize that was a thing. Yeah. Um, One of the guys that, so when we were in Castle Rock, we rented out a facility uh, and co-shared it. And so there was actually Lost Coffee is the coffee company on Castle Rock. They have like three shops now. They had a coffee truck also at the time that like they hardly used because uh, they just had shops and had grown out of it. But we shared space with them. And so we would use their roaster, which was awesome. And like they're, you know, it was it was a huge blessing because he gave me like an incredible deal. I don't remember. I think it was like 100 or $200 a month, like for a small space of his warehouse. But it was a huge blessing just to be able to like, have a space, use his roaster, uh, which could crank out like 30 pounds at a time. So we could do 120 pounds in an hour. So like that volume was just huge oh, yeah. uh, to, to be able to do. And so uh, I miss those days where you can just like drop 30 pounds in 15 minutes and be done. But um, yeah, so we sold some of the accounts to him. He had been like, hey, you guys are like selling it. Like you have some great accounts, like can I, you know, talk to them and see if they'd be willing to like keep the account, but I'll be their supplier. And so uh, we, you know, came up with like a set dollar amount and been like, yeah, you can buy it for X amount. Um, And so that worked out and it was pretty, it worked well. We had gotten into a uh, shop dealership and so like a car dealership. Um, They did a really cool like craft coffee build out. Um, So there was ratio brewers. Uh, We had our cold brew on tap we had milk on tap we did a sparkling tea on tap um and so the people that are like getting their car worked on could sit there and then like get a cup of coffee get some tea cold brew or whatever um and so i like with the owner of the dealership like designed and built all that out and then installed everything yeah so it was we got to do a real a lot of like really cool things where um, our name and story was like in the dealership and you know people would uh, see us and you know be able to like kind of see the story of like hey Champ supports like local coffee and this is who we're supporting so uh, it was a fun build out but like that kind of stuff was also just like really time demanding because I'm trying to figure out like how to keep milk at temperature from a tap 
Um, and so people could literally like pour their cold brew and then pour some milk or whatever they wanted into it. Um, but like the refrigerator was aware, like away from where the spout was. So I had to keep like the tube cooled and like forced air going through it and stuff. So a lot of that like was time demanding. And then you're like trying to do events. You're trying to keep up with wholesale accounts. You're trying to keep up with your regular route for the office buildings. And it was just like, you're getting up super early. You're roasting until like eight o'clock at night. So, I mean, no doubt we probably worked like 80, 90 hour weeks. Uh, and it was just, it was crazy. So we ended up selling, selling the trailer, selling some wholesale accounts. Uh, we got out of it, learned a ton. Um, and the reality, the sad reality is, is like, we could have opened a shop. Like we did $70,000 in that first year, um, which was like pretty great um, for what we had done. And uh, we were able to pay ourselves and live off of it. And you know, pay our loan we had in the rental space and everything. And so uh, we could have like hired people, you know, even if it was just to run the cart and we did the truck and then like eventually got in a shop. And I think we could have grown to that point. Um, but like at the time we were newly married, I was young. Like I didn't know what I now know about like running a business and not working a business, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Uh, like being, being an owner and not just like a, a worker um i think that transition for people is tough especially when like it's something you're so passionate about you're like you hold on to it i think a little more tightly because it's like man i've had this dream this passion for so long and now looking back like you can kind of like let things go like okay yeah i want to do chemexes and pour overs but like a fetco does great and cranks out really great volume like let's just get a fetco right so there's things that like you just learn to kind of give up and um and not sacrifice quality i don't think we ever did that but just realize like okay there's really batch brews are great and especially like that because you can kind of like preset to like bloom for 30 seconds and then how many pulses you want to do and um they're really great like brewers and stuff so um when did y'all sell it what? so we sold it we did it for a full year so we sold it in 2017 um and sold the coffee truck and the wholesale accounts and then uh we moved up to the mountains and uh i worked at a prison up here and i'm actually now a cop so i work uh, the streets out here and so um we then like had some extra money and i was like man like i miss roasting like I haven't roasted in a while. Like we still have the name storyline and um, all that kind of stuff. And so we sold the like truck and wholesale accounts, but kept the business, if that makes sense. Um, the name and all that kind of uh, intellectual property, allegedly. <laughs> so uh, we, we kept that and uh, I was like, man, I'd, I'd love to get into roasting again. And that's when I like got back in this whole world of like, so we were probably out of coffee for like a year or two. Um, and it felt like I had been gone for 10 years because there was like all these new roasters and new technology and stuff. Oh, it changes so quick, dude. Yeah. New brewing devices, like everything. Yeah, it was crazy. I was like, and especially when you're like so in it, you know, um, like we were, we were super fortunate, uh, like Phil with Corvus Coffee. I don't know if you've ever heard of Corvus or Sweet Blue. Actually, I went there in July. I went, yeah, I went by Corvus Coffee. Uh, coffee oh no way which yeah. uh which place did you go to you remember which one of Dude, it was somewhere around denver because i remember it was when we were leaving it was one of the last ones i went to in denver and it was heading south to colorado Springs. so yeah uh, yeah whatever one would be kind of in there i know it was about yeah. like a i think it's about home depot and all that i don't know it's, it yeah. was nice it had the like the roaster in there and stuff it was like behind yeah. glass yeah and, yeah uh, that's their like flat, that was their first shop yeah uh, super cool super cool yeah spot. They had their like probat in there, right? I think no it was. Uh, I want to say I can't remember what I, I got a picture of it, but uh, yeah, I remember it was glassed in and like you could tell yeah. they had like you um, know. Phil's the owner and um, Daniel was actually their roaster at the time when we were doing coffee. And like I remember the first cupping we did, 
there was like two farmers from origin that were there and there was like six other coffee shop owners and there was 40 coffees around this table all with like two cups each and i had never done a cup before and i was like so intimidated because i'm like okay there's a coffee shop owner there's a farm like what am i doing and so i just like totally faked it till i made it um and i had a I had a pretty good palate developed because I'd been roasting for so long. So like that part, I like felt okay with, but I was like, they're like doing weird stuff with a spoon and slurping. Like, I don't know what's going on. And so uh, that was my first cupping, but they were like super. And we had a couple of coffees that were on the table. Um, they were super cool. And I just was like, Hey, like, how would I make this better? They're like, well, I think it's a little underdeveloped, like get a little more, you know, after first crack and I'd slow down your roast towards the end. And just like really try to like help me kind of dial in what I was doing right and wrong. And they're like, you've got really good like fruit notes on it and good acidity, but like it's kind of lacking some of the body on the back end. And so um, it was really cool just to like connect with those shop owners and um, just like have that kind of inclusive environment. Um, Eric and uh, Andy with Sweet Bloom, they were also awesome and they would do like classes and cuppings and stuff there and um, there'd be like latte art competitions and so the Denver like coffee scene was super cool and then when we came up here to the mountains I was just like so used to that so when I was starting to like look about getting another roaster I reached out to the local roaster here and I was like, hey man, like I'd love to do like a cupping with you and just like talk coffee and whatever. And it was like such a different vibe. And I just like wasn't expecting that. And he's like, man, how, I don't know if I can have you come into the shop. Like, I don't know if I can have you like see my roaster, my setup and everything. And I was like, just like totally took me off guard because I was just expecting the like same atmosphere and environment. And um, and it wasn't that. And I was like, that's okay. It's, that's how like you want to run a business there's nothing wrong with that but um I was like all right like so much for like sharing a roasting space again like you know <laughs> I was like so I started looking at like the Akawa roaster I was like man that's just like super small um if I like want to sell it or anything like that I can't do that and so I ended up finding the Aleo and I don't know if I'm butchering the name of it um but I have a hard time with it too yeah, I don't know. I'm I think it's a little, a little, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, the bullet roaster, which was a, it's a two kilo roaster. So it does, I can get about two pounds out of it. Um, and it's electric, which is nice. Um, but the technology and it's incredible. Like it has a infrared bean sensor. Uh, and so there's like your typical bean probe, which is getting the temperature of the outside of the beans as it runs around that little probe. Um, but the infrared is actually getting like the inside of the bean tub. And so what? I never even heard of that. That's cool. Yeah. It's a, it's crazy cool technology. Um, and so you actually have two bean probes going as you're going on your roasting graph and they're like, how different is it? Yeah. At times it's like 20, 30 degrees difference, oh, which wow. Makes does sense. It ever, if you, does it ever like kind of meet? For sure. Yeah. So at the beginning, it's real close. And for the first like four minutes, it's like pretty on top of each other. And then after that, it starts like kind of separating, which when you think about the process of roasting, like you're getting more energy built up inside, um, but you've got to heat the inside of it. The outside's getting pretty hot. The inside of it's still pretty cool and still has moisture content in it. So you kind of, it makes sense when you really think about it, like, okay, there is that separation from the outside of the bean, which is going to be hot towards the inside, but still has some of that moisture and it's getting to the point of cracking. So, yeah. but yeah, it's cool technology. Um, and it like kind of met all the things I needed. I was like, man, I don't know if I can like run gas to like my shed in the back of my house. And, what's it run on? Oh, just electric? Yeah. So it's electric. Um, and what's great about it is you can crank out like roast after roast, um, like back to back roast. There's not like, you don't have to have like a cool down period and then like have it reheat back up or anything like that. So I can get through like eight pounds of coffee in an hour, um, which for like the bullets pretty great. Um, so, and you can also run it where you can build out a profile that will automate it. Um, so it'll do everything for you. 
um, if you choose to do so. Oh, um, really? I didn't realize that. Yeah. So it's really great in the sense of like, and I typically don't run it on the automated just because like, I don't, I'm a freak, I guess, and just want like control of it. <laughs> and so, um, but there's times that I'll like let it go automated and then like take, you can then take back over and like change things as it's going. And, you know, if you want to increase some airflow at the end or whatever, you can do that, which is different from your automation. So it's a really cool, like it comes with its own roasting software with it. Um, and it produces really great coffee. It's a little uh, drum roaster, ain't it? Yeah, it's a little drum, electric drum roaster. Um, yeah, it does two pounds at a time, which like, what I like about it is the cost effectiveness. Like it's $2,800. Um, so comparatively to other like two pound roasters, like it's pretty cheap. And with like technology and everything that it comes with, um, it's got kind of like everything that I wanted out of it. And, it looks um, sturdy too. It looks like a little, oh, yeah. little tank. Yeah, that thing, <laughs> it's kind of, it's pretty like impressive in the sense of like, you've got to clean it pretty regularly in the sense, just because like uh, we've got like a decent amount of wholesale accounts and like our subscription and all that stuff's going pretty good. So uh, at times like we were roasting like 40, 50 pounds in a day on it. Um, but like it, it cranks through that like amount of coffee, like pretty easily. Um, so you just got to like keep it clean and, um, but yeah, it's super durable. The like, uh, I haven't really had any issues with this. I can't say like how the customer service is on it because I've just never needed it. But they have like really great videos online of like how to clean it, what to do. Where are they from? Of... Are they like when you ordered it, where did it come from? So we, they're based out of Taiwan, I think. But uh, Sweet Maria's carries them here in the United States. So. Okay, so like a distributor? Exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. So I bought it from Sweet Maria's. So it didn't take you like months and months to get it or nothing then? No. Yeah. It was. And at the time, like they were back ordered. And so it was one of those like crazy things where you're like logging on your computer at like 9 p.m. And the second it hits nine, you're like trying to put an order in because they're like selling out super quick. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So we got one of them, which was great. And yeah, it, it came in like, I think it was like two weeks. Uh, and, uh, yeah, unboxed it, got it all set up, and you have to like do a couple seasoning roasts, and then you're good to go. Um, How long have you been roasting on it now? So I've been roasting on it for almost, I think this summer will be two years. Okay. Uh, so like I've got a good amount of time behind it. Um, there's a really cool shop called uh, Prototype Coffee. They're in Australia, and they have three of them set up in their shop. And so a customer can come in and see their coffee roasted fresh, like on a screen. Um, and so they can like pick from this crazy list of like 20 or 30, like green coffees and get it roasted fresh while they like have a cup of coffee. Wow. Um, that's cool. And then yeah. they bagged up and they take it out after their coffee. Absolutely. That's cool. Yeah. That's, a good little, yeah. that's a cool little setup. Yeah. And it's cool because like it's electric, you can have like a small ventilation system set up in there and, really you don't need like a fan or anything to operate with it as long as it's just going straight up. And um, so for me, that was like, oh, that'd be, that'd be pretty cool. Like if eventually you wanted to get two or three of them, you can, you can do that. And then you're roasting like six pounds at a time, you know, for like pretty affordable compared to like, if you got what would be like a six or eight pound roaster. It's actually about the same out. thinking about it. Like I've been pricing them and yeah. yeah, you you literally can just get a bunch of little uh mm -hmm. little bullets and line them up. Right. So, and I don't know, man, I go back and forth. I think what I'm I'm leaning more towards because I think after this summer, like we'll be maxed out on this one bullet. Um, so I kind of want to just go to like getting a 10 kilo roaster and being able to do 15 pounds at a time, just because it's like trying to manage two laptops and two roasters at one time is is a lot in some senses and you can automate it so like on one hand it's like okay i can just set it and forget it and focus on one or vice versa or you know have two of them going at different times so it's doable but it is nice to just have like 15 pounds going 
and that's all you're focused on and you can crank it out and be done. But for people like starting out, I think it's a good, it's a good option of, it gives you the versatility in the sense of like, um, I guess if you have like a really robust hood in your kitchen, you can literally roast inside your house. Um, my house isn't that fancy, so I don't have one of those like really nice hoods yeah. that come over. Um, but yeah, I've seen people like roast in their kitchen. And so when people starting out, I think it's a good option for like, it can let you do volume and also you can roast like a pretty small amount on there if you want to do samples and stuff. Um, so it's pretty versatile in a lot of senses, which is why I really like it. But yeah, I think starting out, I wish instead of getting like the Bedelli, I wish I would have went and got like the Aliyu. But I don't, it's, it's in the beginning, you just, you see something and like you, you haven't devoted enough time to like looking at things and this, that, right. and the other. So you kind of just get whatever you first kind of see and, you know, the cheapest or whatever. But yeah, I wish yeah. I would have kind of looked into the Alio a little bit. It looks like a pretty cool little machine. So yeah, is that all you do now then is really just roast and sell wholesale coffee and uh, you, so you, you're not you're not doing any type of like uh, drinks or anything like that then? Correct. Yeah. So we've um, what we're doing right now is we have wholesale accounts. So <clears throat> there's like a rafting company up here. There's Trail Sisters, which is like a women's trail running company. They carry um, our coffee and have tons of followers all across the United States. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think where else. There's uh, Blackboro downtown. There's a couple uh, like we live in the mountains, so it's really like touristy area. So there's a lot of like Airbnbs up here. And so people will manage like 10 or 20 Airbnbs up here. And for gifts for their customers, like when people come stay with them, they'll get a bag of our coffee. Um, and then there's a new craft uh, coffee shop, the long table that uh, they're building out. And so um, she's got like a, it's called a ground control brewer. I don't know if you've ever seen it before, um, mm -mm. but it's got like a glass bulb up top and it swirls the coffee out of it. It, oh, yeah, brews, yeah, okay. it, it brews it in a vacuum um, and it's supposed to be like the best batch brewed coffee you can get. So she's got that. She's got a uh, GB5 espresso machine. Um, so she's got like really awesome equipment. And so um, she, I don't know, I can't remember how we ended up getting connected. I think it was just a mutual contact we had. Um, and so she's going to carry our coffee. And I'm starting to do some like consulting work for her. So um, I'll come in and like train all of her staff on like how to do latte art and uh, pull shots and also like how to taste coffee, um, do cuppings with them and just like kind of provide education on Hey, how to, here's how I would set up your shop if I were doing it. Like here's yeah. where I put your register. Here's where I put your espresso machine, you know, kind of all that kind of stuff. And then a big part of it though is really just training staff and um, getting them the knowledge and base to kind of feel more confident. It's like, you know, Hey, keep it really simple. Like don't go crazy on your menu, have two sizes for your drinks starting out. Like keep it really simple because it then, you can always add things. I think sometimes starting out, you're like, oh, but well, I could do this specialty drink and I should have this size and you could do cold brew, but also bottle the cold brew. And it's like, man. That's where like, I'm at right now. Yeah. That, yeah. That's because I'm like, I'm like the menu with food and this, that, and the other. And then my yeah. wife, she's sitting there. She's like, but then you got to like think about where you're going to put everything. Like so much of this takes refrigeration, so much of this. And it's like, just scale it back. Like what, what can you handle? And like you're saying, you can always add too, but if you right. buy all this stuff and then you don't sell it or, or you can't like quite figure it out, like you're just wasting a bunch of stuff, you know? So totally. Yeah, that's, and that's what, what I would tell people when they're like starting out is like, get, get more space in the sense of like refrigeration, electrical, like give yourself room to grow. But when you start out, like keep it really simple because you don't want to have to be like, oh man, like I wish we had another outlet here because we really need, like we want to do whatever, like add in another equipment or another brewer. So like go robust on that side. But I would just say like, man, keep it super simple because one, you can then really focus on quality control because so much of like people 
when they first come in, if you're dialed in and like you get them a really great cortado and like, oh my gosh, this tastes like a blueberry muffin, they're going to come back. Whereas if you like are so spread thin over everything you're trying to do and you like screw up some things, they're going to be like, man, like they've got a lot going for them, but like it wasn't that good. They're probably not coming back. Yeah. Um, So I would just recommend like, keep it simple. You can always grow and add things. And that's what I was telling the lady up here. Like, Hey, you know, if you're going to switch things up, like switch up coffee, like you can have a different single origin come in and like keep people interested that way. But initially like get your staff comfortable with what they've got and then like give them the freedom of like, Hey, like let's develop a specialty drink. Like let's mess around with like maple syrup and brown sugar and cinnamon and like give them the freedom and opportunity to like invest and develop and build their palate and try different things out. And then you get really good buy-in with your employees and, you know, then their passion when someone's like, what's the seasonal drink? Like, Oh, like I actually made it. Like, let me tell you all about it. Right. And the customer then gets a cool experience of like, Oh my gosh, like, yeah, absolutely. I want that. You know? So, um, Whereas like, if you come in and you're trying to like train your staff, it's like, okay, it's like, you got to shake off the brown sugar and then we're going to torch the top of it for like a toast of Martin. Like, <laughs> is it too much? They're like, I just, I don't even know how to pull a shot of espresso yet. Like, yeah. Like, no, that's so, definitely true. Um, so what's your goals with everything then? What's, what's, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I sense that you eventually want to open that coffee shop or something. Is that something you still want to do or? Yeah. So kind of where I'm at right now, what we're really focused on is like wholesale accounts consulting, but we've got a subscription that we're doing. Um, and so we do like educational videos with it. And so, uh, we talk about like processing methods and like high elevation coffees, varietals. Um, because for myself personally, even when I was in the industry, like I pick up a bag of coffee and it'd be like a bourbon varietal, 2000 meters elevation, these tasting notes. And I was like, oh, that's cool. What is that like actually? Why does that even matter? Apart from the fact that like you're telling me how high it's grown and what varietal, like it just, the only thing I really honestly cared about was tasting notes. I think that's most people. But the reality is, is like the varietal of coffee, like actually will impact pretty greatly, like the tasting notes you can expect to get out of it. Like higher elevation coffees will be more like tropical and more fruity if it's like above 2000 meters and like 1500 will have more like dark berry notes and stuff like that. So those things like actually have an impact on tasting of the actual cup and how it's processed. Like if you have a wash process, it's going to be more clean and easier to taste those tasting notes. And, you know, like a honey process, you're going to have that mucilage left on there and it's going to be allowed to dry and you're going to get a lot of that sweetness and some of that crazy fruit notes you'd see in a dry process, but not as much. So all those kind of things are like super intimidating and overwhelming to people like getting into coffee and, um, but really fun to learn if it's done in like an approachable manner. And so we do like a write up um, and then do a video every week kind of going into just different things whether it's processing origin you know um brewing methods like okay if you're getting like a really bitter taste in coffee how do you change your variables whether it be grind setting whether it be your time um do you want to try like immersion versus like pour over and stuff like that so we kind of go into all that with our subscription service and um it's been a ton of fun we have like two levels to it so the first level is um we have coffee content and then also coffee gear so we'll send them like origami dripper and a hand grinder send them like a coffee journal and so we send them like cool gear that like i nerd out on and i'm like super excited about like we sent out like fellow mugs um and then do like videos like showing like hey this is why the origami is really cool because it can do like a cone filter as well as the like uh wave filters which is the flat bomb so it's a versatile brewer and like here's why i like it how i like the ratios i would use and also just like letting people experiment so helping people understand like hey i like really fruity floral like bright coffees but if you don't like there's nothing wrong with that like 
here's how I would brew the coffee to pull out more of those like chocolatey notes, like do an immersion, like don't bloom your pour over, or don't bloom your French presses. Like if you want to get like more acidity out of your French press and some of those like berry notes, like bloom it and then like let it sit. So just different things like that, that um, you can kind of like educate people through the subscription. And so that's like uh, gone really well for us, better than I ever anticipated. Um, I had kind of set a goal when we first started, like, man, it'd be really great if we had like 20 or 25 subscribers at the different levels, whether that be like once a week, twice a month or whatever. Um, and we hit that within like three months. And so, um, so it went pretty well for us. And that's been just fun because I have all this like knowledge built up in my head and it's fun to be able to kind of like get it out oh, there yeah. in, a, in a way. So do you mind um, sharing how many subscribers you have now or? Yeah, so we're right. So we've, I've only been doing the subscription for three months. So I'm at like 25, 20, oh, 25 cool. subscribers right in there. So what's, um, your, what's your, like, what's your goal with that? Like how, how many could you, is there a limit on how many you could have or? Um, and that's, what's nice about like doing the content stuff is I have the capacity to, oh, you yeah. know to roast whatever but like once you've created the like write-up video like it's kind of it's really scalable so yeah i can crank out like people yeah so that's what i really like about it um i've also toyed around with the idea of like doing an ebook or like a video course so some of this is like trial for those things of like hey i'm creating like write-ups and um, content that i can maybe use like down the road for other things so um it's just good to like like you were saying going back to like just get yourself out there um you know like sitting in front of a camera is intimidating at first and like I was like gosh I'm gonna sound stupid you know <laughs> or like I'm gonna I'm gonna have to do so many takes and once you do it and like post it and like get good feedback it it like eases your mind to know like hey like people actually like this they're interested in what I'm doing yeah uh, the other okay. thing is like, I mean, do you edit any of your stuff or do you do like one, one take? I just do one take. One take? Um, so, which I don't know if that's the most efficient way. What do you like? Do you edit your stuff? As I have happens? to, because I mean, my speaking abilities are, are not that good. I say a lot and then I can't sit there and read something and then like, you know, regurgitate it. So I kind of have to go off the cuff a little bit. So then there's yeah. so much stuff I cut out, like, I mean, I, I may make a 40 minute video and whittle it down to 10 minutes. And that that's what goes on YouTube, yeah. you know, and it's just, sure. I don't know, you know, I, I, I don't do too good, but like some people are just really good and can, can sure. get out their point of view really quickly, but I, I, I never yeah. have. So I have to edit a lot. Is but the, once you realize the power of the edit, like, I mean, you can save, yeah. you know, you can save so much content with, with editing mm. if for somebody right. like me, you know, but if you can, get all out there that's that's super cool is the like editing side of things pretty like time intensive yeah like in the beginning i mean it took me a long time i'm i'm fast at it now just because i've gotten sure. like you know i'm at 60 something videos up but it's yeah. like yeah like now it doesn't take too long because i have gotten better and that's the other thing too that's why i started all this in the first place like i want to get better at speaking and kind of sure. doing all this but yeah it, do, it doesn't take too long now uh i can knock out a, a good video within two or three days usually and that's you know my full-time job kids and then kind of doing everything yeah. at night so right uh, no i feel that again. yeah i like i think i mainly do one take just in the sense of like editing's like intimidating to me i feel like i'm gonna make it worse well i'll make it better so i take like a lot of takes initially um especially because i cut it to where like so the content videos are like 10 minutes long usually um, and then the write-up to go with it. But I throw out on like Instagram, just like a one minute, like, hey, here's like what we're going to cover this week. And uh, here's what we're talking about, just like some highlights from it. And so I do that as the intro, cut it, throw that up on Instagram. And then um, if people subscribe, then they get the like full version um, of the like info and in depth and all that kind of stuff. So that's cool. Um, yeah, it works out well. Um, it's kind of been a fun, like we're trying to step into a lot of like content creation and 
video stuff. And so it's been a fun world to kind of step into. I've never like done any of that before. Um, and so it's been a fun process and, you know, you learn a lot just even from like uploading videos on YouTube and, you know, like resolution and screen, like all that stuff you just don't even think about before you do oh, yeah. it. But um, kind of going back to your question of like, what are the goals and long-term stuff? So we've got the subscription, which we're really excited about. The other thing is I'm super passionate about just like helping people like along in their journey and where they're at. And so um, if people want to like reach out to me on Instagram, they can hit me up at like Storyline Coffee and just like ask me questions. Like I'm not going to charge you anything. Um, I'd love to just like if people are starting out roasting or like wanting to do a coffee cart or truck or a shop, like I'm an open book and would love to just like connect with people and like further what they're doing. Um, which is why like a lot of our wholesale accounts, like we white label for them. Um, like, Hey, if you, if you want to use our coffee and, uh, like brand yourself, like I'm all for it. Like, let's make you as big and as great as we can. And like, I'll give you all the marketing and ideas I have. And if you want them great, if you want to do your own thing, awesome. So, um, <clears throat> I'm starting to kind of like look into like doing some more consulting and stuff. Um, I've been roasting for a long time. I have a lot of like experience on like doing build outs and what kind of that looks like just from my experience in doing that and um, help some other people with their shops and things. So um, kind of like looking to step into more consulting. And then I think eventually my wife and I still do want to have like a coffee shop. Uh, the lady up here that was doing the uh, long table was like, hey, like how much money do you make? Like what do you think about running this? <laughs> um, which was like super enticing because like she has sweet equipment and like it's a it's a gorgeous like brick building with white, like it's awesome. Uh, but like, I love my job. I love what I do. Um, so I was like, man, I just, I don't think it's the right time yet. So um, eventually I'd love to do something that's like more, more automated. I don't know if you've seen the like Morocco, they have like a, uh, like a spout almost is what it looks like that comes up and underneath is where you've actually got the coffees. And so I love to do something where you can come in for like four or five bucks, get a cup and try like any of the different coffees that we have on tap essentially. Um, or just like get a cup of whatever one you want. Um, and so it's like, I've had that idea. and I love the idea of like being able to roast coffee fresh for people in front of them um, and talk about roasting, get a bag to go. And then just have like a small double head that like I can do lattes, but like pretty limited. Um, and then have like maybe a big roaster behind the scenes that like helps us with wholesale and stuff. Like that's kind of the the long term goal. I'd love to do something that because one, it cuts down on your staffing needs a lot. Like um, you can have really one person run it for the majority of the time, and like maybe two people. Um, if a lot of it's automated with like cold brews and coffees on tap and lattes on tap and stuff like that so um and people love like doing stuff themselves um we had like a a kegerator set up and we'd turn it around so like people could pour their own and like people loved it <laughs> um, yeah i'm, I'm kind of like that too because like some days you, you know I, you don't have time to wait in the line and you just if i if there was something that i could go and just make my own chemex coffee at somebody's shop like with some right new coffee that I want to try like I'd rather just go make my own but I don't really ever see any kind of like that which I mean around here there's not enough maybe like in Denver you know Seattle yeah. you could probably do something like that but probably not around here but yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's pretty cool I, I man I, I think you have like so much knowledge to be able to pull it off like I'm kind of envious because <laughs> it's like I feel like I'm just walking into this abyss and uh, Dude, but, I'm just trying to learn yeah. everything as I go you know Here's the thing that you got to realize is like, I was in your shoes 100% when I first started this. Like I'd never pulled a shot of espresso. I'd never seen milk. I had roasted like you have, but like that was it. And so yeah. it's intimidating, but at the same time, like you're, you've got great, like you're personable, you'll connect well with people. Like you've got a great following and you built kind of that, like, um, you know, customer base already. And so you'll crush it. And I think a lot of people don't end up in, you know, I'm stoked that you're doing this, but I think a lot of people like 
end up not doing it's like man i just like i wish i knew what he knew and it's like look the best way to do it is just by learning you know and you know what else kind of like what you've been saying too like the community is so like helpful like i can call some of the roasters up around here like oh, I, I went over there to one today and it's like i just feel i have like support a support team who's like mm-hmm. literally just you know helping me i mean like one of them has given me his numbers like straight up like his yeah. business plan like i mean just giving me everything you know and it's just like and it's like you're saying it's not competition it's just it's like i'm going to try to promote him as much as possible it's like yeah I, I want to build us all up because like, I realize there's so much room around here to grow. Uh, we could probably have another 50 shops around here uh, sure. before we was even maxed out, you know? So it's like, there's yeah. definitely a lot of growth and it's like, I just feel it's so supportive around here. Kind of like what you were saying, how, how Denver was. And it's like, I, I'm not scared because like, I just feel like mm-hmm. I can easily pick up the phone and say, Hey, I'm having this problem. And within five, 10 minutes, they'll be able to say, Hey, yeah you know, maybe you need to do this or don't do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And we ran into the same, like when we were sharing the space with the other roaster, I remember like the gas cut off once and not like mid roast. So like there goes 15 pounds of coffee, whatever. But then like wouldn't come back on. And I was like panicked because we had a wholesaler to go out the next morning. And it was like 50 pounds. I was like, you know, and they were a shop, so like they're expecting to have coffee, you know. And I was like, what do I do? So I called him up and he's like, Oh man, I'll be right over. You know, showed up, like got it working again. And so yeah, it's super there's tons of people. Like even now, I've reached out to a lot of those guys from Corvus and Sweet Bloom and like all the other amazing shops that Denver has, and just been like, Hey, there's an opportunity for someone who like up here in the mountains that like wants to run a coffee shop, like she'll pay them and like, let them kind of take off and run with the shop. And, you know, they've reached out and just been like super supportive, like, Hey, like I'll, you know, I'll talk to some of my staff and like, see if they know anyone. And so it's been cool. Just like, you know, you've got that safety net of people behind you to be like, Hey, I did this, this, and this, and like, don't do that. And, you know, this like worked really well. I never would have thought it would. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, like looking back, I wish I would have gotten double group head express machine instead of a single. Uh, I wish I would have had like something for like hot chocolate because we do like high school football events at night. And so like some people are drinking coffee, but it was like, can I get six hot chocolates? And I was like sitting back there like steaming milk to try to make hot chocolate. And it's like, I was just so overwhelmed with like trying to keep up with like get hot chocolate out it's like those kind of things you never think about um until you're in it so i'm always the kind of person like hey if i can learn from other people's mistakes so they can learn from mine like that's a huge win-win so heck yeah dude shoot yeah. well dude this has been a good conversation bro yeah man likewise it's been i'm super honored uh, to come on and yeah like i said i if anyone that's listening or anyone of your followers like wants to reach out with questions or if you have any questions, like um, they can hit me up. I might be hitting you up, dude. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like shoot me an email, a text. Like um, I'm pretty active on Instagram, social media and stuff. So um, they can find me on Instagram and store on coffee roasters. And yeah, I'd love to just like share what I know. And, uh, I've roasted on a lot of different machines and sizes and stuff. But um, but yeah, I've learned a ton just from your podcast too. Like there's a guy on recently that was talking about a roaster I'd never heard of. I was like, oh man, like, let me check that out. Cause I'm at that point where I'm starting to look for like the next roaster that I may want to get. And like, sometimes I f- it feels so hard when you're like doing Google searches to like find like what's out there, you know? And I'm like, yeah. oh, I feel like I've exhausted everything I can, but uh, there's always like new different, like good stuff out there that you just don't know really exist. So. Yeah. Was it the arc or something? No, it wasn't the arc. Let me look it up. I have a, I got a note real quick. Um, I wrote down, it's the uh, Buckeye Roaster. Oh yeah, the Buckeye Roaster. Okay, that's kind of I've like never... mine. It's like a Bedelli Roaster or whatever. Yeah, it's uh, it's made over in in China. I know Buckeye. They get them and basically rebrand them uh, okay. for their Phoenix Oro and stuff like that. Got so it. yeah, yeah, I, I hadn't heard of it before, but. And it's the same thing with like where people source coffee too, you know, <clears throat> like 
genuine origin and sweet maria's and coffee shrub and like we use royal they're like they have a crown jewel um that's like really experimental stuff like anaerobic processing and different fermentations and um so that's like where we kind of like go to for experimental coffees um and they have really great videos where they have like q graders on that'll be talking about like how they cupped it how they roasted it even um because some of the coffees are pretty expensive but um so yeah there's just like there's so much out there that i think in the coffee world sometimes like because there's so much it's, you can get lost in it you know oh yeah um, definitely so um you know i've got a lot of resources and even if people are starting out like we we buy 60 kilo bags from um olam because they ship like for like 75 bucks i think they just upped it to 90 but Olam will ship you a 60 kilo bag through FedEx, which is pretty affordable. Uh, so you don't have to like buy a pallet and their coffees are incredible. So if like someone's starting out like a home roaster and wants to be able to get coffee at a good price, like I'll ship them green coffee and like they can buy it from me. And so, you know, okay. I just, I want to be a resource to people. Um, and it's fun. Like I, I love learning out about coffee. And talking, yeah. So. It's fun connecting with everybody and just kind of, learning how everybody else does it and what they're roasting on and i don't know for me it's been cool talking to the farmers and just seeing like what they oh, yeah. think of everything you know it's pretty cool so i got i got a lady from peru i'm trying to get on i'm hoping to get her on this week oh um, cool yeah it's just crazy like you know she was uh their electricity was out there was having a storm or something and they have to go down to i think uh one of the cities in peru i think lima or something like that but she yeah. like uh what's at me like pictures of like you know in the mountains of Peru where they're like working at oh and stuff God. and just like it's yeah. so cool man you know yeah. it's just such different worlds everybody kind Seriously. of just grows up and lives in so no kidding like, and that's one thing I've never been able to do is like go to origin uh and like seed farming and stuff so I'd love to like be able to go over there because it's one thing like I've really dived into that side of like picking and processing and milling like try to learn that side of it as much as I can because uh, I think there's a lot that like then unlocks like oh that's why I'm getting like chocolatey notes or like dried pineapple notes in my coffee is because of like the soil or the varietal or the hybrid or whatever um but actually like getting like there's such a disconnect I think between like farmers and then like the end consumer right like like are they actually getting fair trade wages are they actually like you know, one of the things that kind of shocked me is like the organic stamp, right? Um, yeah. Which is a huge thing in America. Like, oh, I want organic coffee. But what they don't realize is like, that's a huge risk for a farmer to take because they can't use any pesticides. And if they do, they can't get that like organic certification for a couple of years. Yeah. And it's a huge they, investment for them too. It costs a lot to get the certification. Right. And then if you lose it, like you're out of coffee, like you're not making any money for three years. I'm like, if you're not making any money you're not providing for your family and so i try to like educate people on like hey like i know your heart behind wanting more organic coffee and like i'm all about that like here's actually what that kind of means and you know then let them make their kind of like purchasing decision based off that um and so you know there's that kind of there's those side of things where there's just like disconnects where like people think they're doing the right thing by like buying an organic coffee but really like that's a hard thing for farmers to manage you know yeah, it's definitely, uh, I don't know, the more I speak to them, the more I realize, like, I think the more we can, like, connect with them and, like, learn how they do all this process stuff and how they, you know, uh, how, how their farming practices kind of work. Like, I always thought there was a bunch of pesticides you use, but, like, depending on where you're at and stuff like that, like, it's really not. So it's like, I don't know, it really doesn't pay to get organic certifications and all that depending on where you're at i mean yeah it may depend on what you know what country or origin you're in but sure yeah it's one of them things like i don't know if we could just kind of learn more about it i think it kind of broaden everybody's knowledge on it so yeah and just like connecting with the fact that like there's pickers there's farmers there's then like they then bring that to a mill and it gets processed and like sometimes the farmer doesn't have the mill so like you're getting coffee that's from like a bunch of different lots or farmers that then comes in one one bag and so just like helping people understand the different 
processes and what's going on behind the scenes. And I wish there was a way of like getting good like content or getting good education from farmers of like, hey, like this is the stuff that we're like running into a meeting. And, you know, like a lot of the like water tanks for the anaerobic process coffees and stuff, like I just wonder like, man, like how much water are they going through? Like, is that an issue or like, cause I just don't know, like here in, you know, Colorado and other places there's droughts, but like for them, are they just getting dumped on rain and they like have tons of water to do wet yeah. processed coffees? I, I, I think so. Because the ones I was talking to in Guatemala, um, Pablo, they get a ton of rain and it's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's one of them like here in Louisiana, like, I mean, there's no shortage of water. I mean, you dig yeah. three, four feet underground and you're already hitting water. It's, it's, it's insane. Sure. So, I mean, we never, it's so weird. Cause my wife, she's from California and like, they have like this water scarcity mindset and over here, like we don't, we have a well and it, you know, it never runs dry. Like, cause it's, we get so much rain every year. And I right. think it's the same thing down there. I don't think they worry about the water too much, but like in Kenya, or you know places like that you probably yeah. have to i'd imagine so i don't and that's my whole thing i don't know every place is so different you can mm -hmm. learn about what they do in guatemala but it's completely different than what they do in kenya and what they do in india and, and, and other places you know yeah so i don't know that's kind of what i've been wanting to kind of get on is more farmers from different parts of the world but it's just it's hard to connect one thing is time zones i didn't even think about whenever i was <laughs> First right. doing it, you know it's like just trying yeah. to coordinate when everybody can kind of get on and do it but yeah, yeah. you may be doing a late night podcast for the lady in peru then <laughs> yeah she uh well we're actually on a pretty she's a hour oh i guess so there. yeah because like yeah she's not that, that, that one ain't that one ain't too bad which is why i've yeah. been doing most mostly like south american stuff like that because it's just makes sense we're kind of in the same time zone but and with work and everything it's hard to do like africa or india or something like that so right yeah for but, sure um, yeah that's one one of the things that we're looking at doing for our subscription it's like we're currently in like the story of coffee is like the series we're in what i'm throwing around the idea of is like doing like an around the world and so really diving into selecting different origins like different countries each time and then diving into like the farming the processing from each country and so people that as they go through the subscription can kind of be like, oh man, I love like Central American coffees, but even more so I love like Guatemala or I really love Africans. I love Ethiopia. Naturals are okay. They're like super fruit bombs, but a wash is like perfect middle of the road for me. And so thought about like doing kind of an around the world uh, and diving into like a lot of the like processing side of things with it. But I don't know, I've got, I've got a lot of ideas and just trying to, trying to nail it all down and figure out what I want to do so we'll see yeah it's kind of kind of one of the issues I have I I say yes to a lot of things and right you know it's just like you have a lot of ideas and have to you know pull myself back and say focus on one or two get those complete and then right. move on to the next one so yeah absolutely heck yeah dude well oh, Tyler, cool. dude I truly appreciate you being on dude and I'll uh I'll link all your stuff down in the comments and description and all that and uh cool. yeah dude um do you have any last little words and we'll go ahead and wrap her up no i just yeah i want to say thank you and uh like i kind of said before i'd love for people to reach out and connect with me and um if i can help in any way i'd love to be a resource to people out there and um you know i think like we've been talking that's the awesome thing about the coffee community is it's super inclusive and just like wanting to better things and um yeah, I could I could talk for a long time about the like experimental stuff going on in coffee and all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, man, thank you so much for your time, and you're gonna kill it on the new uh, roasting facility and media and everything else. And uh, you've got you've got good support behind you, and you've got a good following, so you'll crush it. And you know, go for it, man. You're gonna do great. So yeah, I, I appreciate hearing that, dude. Uh, need that little bit of you know motivation and stuff so. yeah and when you own a business like I always tell people there's days you feel like you're the best thing that's ever happened and like you're on cloud nine and there's days that you feel like you are the biggest idiot and everything's gonna fail and like riding that emotional roller coaster as a business owner is tough like it's that like repetitive like I'm just gonna keep going like good days bad days there's some days I'm like, man, I'm the greatest thing. And like, we're doing awesome. My, my team's killing it. There's other days I'm like, 
what was I thinking? Like, I never should have done this. And so that emotional roller coaster can be tough, especially when that, like, if you end up like quitting your job after like it gets going for a while, like you feel that like burden of providing, you know, for your family of like, man, okay, I did this. I went for it. We got to make it work somehow. And that stress can be a lot, but um, yeah, that's one of those things too. Just you continue to show up and good days, bad days are going to come and just keep on, keep on, keep on at it, you know? Exactly. Right. So, well, thanks so much, Rob. I appreciate all your time, man. No problem, Tyler. Yeah. I appreciate it, dude. And thank you so much yeah. for coming on, dude. Absolutely. Have a great one. All right, later, buddy. Thank you guys for tuning into the Coffee Runs Deep podcast. And thank you, Tyler, for sharing your journey. Definitely some great takeaways. I definitely took some notes. Big shout out to my patrons for helping make this possible. If you like these episodes, please leave a review, comment, and share so we can continue to grow. Go check out Storyline Coffee Roasters. Links will be below. And I will see you next week. Peace out.